Hey everybody, we got some new campaigns, stuff that's going to fly in under the uh, July 4th weekend time frame, and some stuff that's going to go after it. I'm going to kind of put everything together, it's going to be RPGs and board games all together at once, uh, just so you can see everything that's going to be available during that holiday time. First one up is a game that I thought looked kind of neat, that uh, has a lot of strategy options. It says it does not leave much to chance after you do your initial uh, card shuffling then uh, everything is strategy based which is nice uh, especially since it allows you to get better and more competitive with the people around you at the table hopefully they are the competitive types that will also make you get better uh, as they get better and uh, it's about Rome and moving resources back and forth along a map not a lot of minis not a lot of uh, dice or anything like that no dice that I saw at all um, and you get these little player mats you can see on the right uh, kind of establishes how you're going to use your denarii and where you keep everything so I like that aspect to it um, keeping uh, having those types of player mats makes things themed a lot better you have a theme right in front of you it's, it's staring you in the face the whole time you're playing that does help uh, I think it's an interesting um, it's an interesting game but the theme of Rome for the United States is a little far away especially for me because I don't think you can get further away from Rome in the United States than where I'm at in uh, Los Angeles there might be a few miles off one way or another but uh, yeah it's pretty much on the other side and uh, you know there's just not a lot of people here that are as immersed in the culture as they are in Europe because it's closer right that's their history but that's okay because it leaves the door open for great games like Alter Quest. We've talked about it before. Uh, the graphics are a little old. It says here for 250k, and they're looking at 500. They're getting close. There's going to be so many awesome stretch goals popping in as the final 24 hours starts today. And you may, if you get this at the end of the week and you're watching this, um, you may be past the time when the campaign's going nuts and you still will be able to catch it in a late pledge. Alter Quest is a fantasy game. It has a lot of different options. As you can see in the bottom there, there is a lady with talons on her hands, and that is because she's a harpy, but it's not like the harpies that you see in mythology or in other fantasy stuff because it's a hero and you get to play her. There are some things that are traditional, such as the zombie you see there on the right. Um, but for the most part, the Saddlers are really trying hard to do things outside the box. It will feel familiar. It will feel fantasy. It will feel like a dungeon crawl. Works great for solo play, but you will get a unique experience out of it. They have Isaac Childress, who did Gloomhaven. That's his baby. Is a friend of theirs. He was going to do um, some Brook City stuff, which was the last game that they came out with but that didn't work out because the it didn't make it past the the mark that they needed to hit well he's back helping the saddlers out for alter quest and has a full werewolf expansion set up by him with quests and everything else it is a cool looking game highly modular there's tens of bajillions of ways to play each uh match each game uh it won't be the same game twice ever based on the math which is kind of neat However, you only have to play it 14 or 15 times to play through everything. So that's, you know, 14, 15, and about an hour a piece. You could very easily play through it and get all of your money's worth. Or you could play it till the end of time and still get all of your money's worth and still have something new and different. So Sadler Games, I appreciate them. I put them out there. I'll let you know about it. It's ending. Jump in on the magic. Not so magical is the campaign for King for a Day revised. The reason why I'm saying is it's not so magical is because the campaign doesn't tell you what this book is about. It doesn't tell you what the dice are or anything else. It just says it's a bestseller on Drive Through RPG and it is very, very well rated in its original version. And the only reason I'm paying attention to it at all is to tell you they are giving you this away for free if you backed the original. This campaign doesn't describe what it is anywhere it says that it can be opted in or used for a lot of different things it can be uh, 
it, it slotted into um, rules light RPGs. Great. What is it? It's a, it's a real problem. These guys just didn't think about it. They they got too hyper on their success of uh, all the ratings and other things, and they forgot that they were trying to sell a product and that they need to tell people at the very least what the first version was so that they will be interested in the second version. So again, the only reason I'm telling you this is because some people might get it for free. If you enjoyed it and you want it, you want to um, tell me about it, that's great. Tell them, though, <laughs> hey... You forgot to tell people what the product is. On the flip side, we're coming out of Germany for the next two campaigns. We have some remarkably simple model kits. Uh, well, simple campaigns that de fully describe what they are. These are the Barbarian, based on Frank Frazetta's Barbar Conan the Barbarian artworks. They can't use Conan the Barbarian in anything that they say because it's not a licensed piece. But you can see this guy is molding or sculpting a lot of things that are based on famous Frank Frazetta pieces. The Death Dealer on the right, super famous. If you watch the King Arthur movie, you'd see it in live action there. Uh, Frazetta's been gone for quite a while. He did these in the 50s and 60s, I believe. The original uh, pieces of art, His one of his works last week or the week before went for almost one and a half million dollars. Yeah, everybody loves Frank Frazetta's work, and that's why you should check these out. The model kits look pretty cool. If you are a painter, these are a must. Then we have some something a little more original. That's Servants of Chaos by Fantasy and History, also out of Germany. These guys have orcs and uh, other fantasy types of tropes in their uh, various sculpts that are available for you to use in whatever game that you want. If you just want these to be a table piece or something on your shelf or a display of your incredible uh, painting skills, then that's what these things are for. Uh, I believe they're 28 millimeter, but uh, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure that these ones were 28. They still look pretty big though, uh, and lots of cool detail. The the kind of thing that uh, really sparks the imagination and makes gaming really worth it to have something super cool on your table. But let's face it, the fantasy market appeals to a lot more of the crowd than just the painters, and that's what we have these deck builders like Thunderstone Quest from Alderock Entertainment Group. These guys are coming out with a brand new set of expansions with new quests and other cool stuff. They have neoprene mat mats that you can see on the right. Um, it's all the basic fantasy stuff, but it's a deck builder in the fantasy world. So if you've already jumped in on uh, this type of game, or uh, I don't want to say that it's like one of the living card games like Lord of the Rings or anything else, because it, it kind of follows those same um, types of, uh, of uh, fantasy people pieces that were in the previous campaign of orcs and other things that you could run into but uh, they're also going to expand out and there's some snake people and some other things in the different quests to keep everything interesting and I believe that they are making the full campaign extended so you can use the characters uh, that you played through in the original uh, sets of games if I understood the campaign correctly. And while fantasy is popular, it's not the only thing. Sometimes you need a superhero to uh, take on the baddies. And that's what Tiny Legacies is about. It is a source book for Tiny Supers, which is a game system by Gallant Knight Games. Normally it will be distributed through Drive-Thru RPG. They say that it's ready to go. It's a super cheap thing. I only see about 100 backers so far. So maybe not the most popular um, of these um, versions. I will tell you, I had Heroes Unlimited and a couple other uh, things like Ninja Super Spies, some other Palladium uh, made books when I was a kid that I loved reading through. I loved the idea of thinking about what types of powers were there and available. Uh, I eventually ended up getting those Marvel Super Heroes RPG books, which were awesome. And now my brain is filled with every minutia detail of things that... Uh, happened in the Marvel Universe uh, before 1994 uh, when I stopped going into the comic books because uh, school got too hard. But uh, yeah, man, it's it's a fun thing. It's a fun escapist thing, superheroes being as popular as they are in the uh, film space. Uh, this may be something you want to tackle instead of just uh, smashing, uh, you know, big rats with a hammer or whatever. But then there's also space. And that's what Ascension of the Galaxy is about, spaceship combat. We talked about some other games that 
didn't have anything randomly going on. You could plan ahead and, and fill out a strategy. This game, their tagline is, you cannot plan ahead, period. As you can see the uh, from the pledge levels, it's not expensive at all. Uh, and that kind of shows in the components. Artwork is in there in some for for some things right it's very minimal it's not exactly polished uh while the ships have layouts and uh it's functional it's not the prettiest game ever but you get it for a dollar it's as cheap as you can get something on kickstarter that is exceptionally awesome uh the cool thing about it is every faction is supposed to be different and you can uh you have to play the game in a way that if you're a micromanager or someone that has analysis paralysis about what to do, this, that, the other thing, maybe this game will help you. Um, sometimes it's nice to be able to plan ahead and sometimes it's nice to just live in the moment. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that while all of the uh, factions that are present in the game are different, they're probably going to be very similar to things that you've seen already. So it's not like it will be completely alien to you even though there are aliens in the game. Uh, take a quick look at it if you want something fast paced and uh, you're willing to print stuff out for yourself because it is mainly a PDF game right now. And going from a game that was all about minimal components we have one with deluxe and components and that's Escape with the new quests and traps that they've created there's also a soundtrack that goes with it that tells you when uh, certain things happen in the game. Um, so, you know, you got to have that around with you. Uh, it has specialized dice, and that allows you to move through this temple or escape different things and do different functions. It's a bit more random than some of the other stuff that we've looked at before. Uh, if you have a Indiana Jones Jones and you want to uh, run through the temples and uh, figure your way out, um, the clean games have you covered with escape and uh, all the new stuff that they've brought to the table if you've played through this type of game before um, and you have any interest in it you know let me know let me know if it's been fun for me I am not so much into the random dice thing I'd like to be able to strategize a little more and also in that Indiana Jones time frame we have Crimopolis so it's the 20s just happens to be in Chicago or that type of town uh, this has some neat cardboard minis, uh, sorry, some cardboard buildings with regular wooden block meeple minis. You uh, create your own little city, you move yourself around town, there's lots of different options. You compete against other gangsters. I didn't see anything specifically around bootlegging, uh, although I'm sure that's part of it um, to some degree. It looks neat. The... Uh, uh, rounds are all timed out, so it shouldn't take too long to uh, to finish everything out. So um, they're saying about 20 minutes per uh, per person, which is nice. Uh, I don't know. It's a little on the minimal side for me, and it's got two players as a requirement. I probably wouldn't pick it up, but I do like the idea of uh, this time frame. Not just for all the stuff that I play for uh, Arkham Horror and all the other uh, Thulu-based uh, Lovecraftian stuff. Uh, it would nice to be nice to do something else within this time frame, um, just as an aside to uh, what's going on uh, with the other stuff that I'm reading and playing, all that kind of stuff. And I must not be the only one who feels that way, because the newest Arkham Horror 3rd Edition expansion has been announced and is ready for pre-order. There's not a lot of other information about it other than it also takes place uh, around mafias and uh, weird things that go on in Arkham, but um, aren't necessarily having to do with Dagon or, or any of the other crazy uh, Thulu Mythos type stuff, because there's a lot more factions at play than just the cultists. That's pretty cool, but it's not a Kickstarter thing, so we won't cover it too much here. Uh, if it is something that you think it should be uh, brought into the channel, then uh, give me a heads up. Let me know if uh, you find something like that exciting. Moving back to Kickstarter, we got Kung Fu Fighting by Slugfest Games. And this is another campaign that suffers from not telling you how the game works. Um, it relies far too much on its previous games made by Slugfest, fame, uh, Slugfest Games to show an example of how it plays that is not going to sell a product. That's too much 
looking around and finding things, people will just get tired, then they leave your campaign. Otherwise, I think this could be a fun game, as fun as Exploding Kittens or any of the other neat uh, little uh, card games that you can play at a bar or uh, you know just about anywhere that there's a flat surface. The theme is fun. Art looks nice enough, but it's also mainly a print-and-play kind of game. You're, uh, you're picking up PDFs with the hope of getting, um, in the future for other stretch goals and unlocks, a more complete package. Um, seems pretty easy in the way that the numbers seem to work um, and how the, uh, the, the system will function. Um, if you're looking for something, maybe as a cheap playtest uh, or something that, uh, you know, if you have a printer and some cardstock ready to go, you can make your own then this might be a good option for you as a quick little game that, uh, you know, if you're bored. Then we have a campaign that doesn't suffer from a lack of information, and that's Darwinauts. This looks like it feels, as far as the scoring and the way that the tiles get laid, a bit like Carcassonne, but uh, the story behind it is entirely different. The artwork's pretty neat. Uh, the components look like they'd be a neat game without getting too messy. Um, the scoring with Carcassonne, though, is one of the reasons I play it on my Xbox instead of as a board game. It's just one of those things where it's a little more complicated than uh, that. I, I wouldn't feel so comfortable uh, right away knowing that I scored everything correctly. I'd feel a little bit uh, hesitant and uh, trying to figure out the strategy and whatnot. Uh, but if it's the type of game for you, if that's uh, something that you enjoy playing or your group enjoys playing, or uh, you want to get a quick jump on uh, tile laying strategies, this could be a nice sci-fi way for uh, you all to get involved. And I've said a lot that this is probably not the best weekend to be coming out with a game, especially if you want a U.S. market, which makes it perfect for Takaro, which is not for the U.S. market, it's for the New Zealand market. That means that this little game will get a lot more uh, viewership by not having the huge U.S. games blow it out of the water and make it harder to find on Kickstarter. This is basically a memory matching game with a linguistic component of understanding the Maori language. That is one of the indigenous people's languages of New Zealand. So in order to help them maintain uh, their language and for the kids in the different schools to be able to learn, they make this cool little uh, matching game that makes them have to say it out loud and there's an app that they can scan in and um, they have to they can learn the pronunciation from the app and they're also going to be giving away a bunch of uh, copies to New Zealand schools. So for the broader audience that maybe is just looking for something new to learn from a language they probably will never use but maybe they have the joy of learning new things maybe they uh, just go for broke and hit the random button on uh, Duolingo just to see if you can learn some crazy version of Gaelic or whatever it is that they've got going just because you got nothing else going on. There are a lot of polyamath type people out there and uh, that's who this would be for if you're not a part of the New Zealand culture or you're not uh, a far-flung member of the Maori and uh, you just want to maintain your, uh, your presence in that culture. I hope it doesn't... Uh, just encourage a bunch of people to culturally appropriate in the future, but uh, give it the respect that the you know a long-standing and uh, diverse culture uh, deserves. So if this is something that interests you, hit them up at Tuckero. Next, we have a neat little game called Habitats Exile Expansion. <clears throat> the neat thing about this, it's another tile laying game, but the uh, way that the tiles work is a little bit different than what I've seen in other games you would place the tile upside down to note that it has no uh, its requirements has not yet been met which are the icons above the animal what you're looking at while the animal is cute and neat and a little bit representative of what's going on you're looking at the different terrains so you have grassland uh, desert area water and like a jungle and uh, as those meet up on the edges of the board the skunk or badger or whatever needs four dry land and one grassland in order for it to flip. So four of its corners would have to be met, sorry, three of its corners would have to be met with uh, the dry land because it's already on dry land. 
um, and then it would be put next to another uh, animal that lives on grass and then it would flip and you would get points. <clears throat> As you move uh, around the board and do different things, it uh, it's educational to a degree that it should be representative of where these animals live and then get an understanding of uh, different types of uh, crazy animals that live in the world. Um, you see a bird, like a flamingo, but it's sitting there in water. Normally you'd see the fish in water. Well, you could talk to the, your kid and be like, why would this be a water bird? What is it that they do? Oh, they eat little plankton. Um, lots of neat things conversation-wise you can bring up in this type of game for educational purposes. And it's competitive because uh, you have to utilize some level of strategy to go with it. So I think it's neat. That's Habitats. And then we're finally breaking through the weekend of July 4th into Exodus Rise of the Corruption. This, in the best way possible, looks like a generic space game. You are running around, flying through the cosmos, and you're being chased by something, and you're exploring different worlds, and you might run into allies, and you might run into enemies. Yeah. Okay, lots of different games are like that. This, The storyline seems to be a combination of Mass Effect and uh, the first couple seasons of Battlestar Galactica, the new one, not the original. And uh, that's not a bad thing at all. Um, if you are a fan of those types of worlds, then... I think you might enjoy this, even though you're going to be on the run trying to catch whatever portal or MacGuffin that uh, the game throws out there. The art is, I'd say, B-plus level. It's not the best I've ever seen, but it's definitely better than some of the stuff we've seen on even on this episode and a lot of the other space games that are out there. A lot of work's been put into it. I like that it's got solo play. Um, the uh, player mats for each faction seem to uh, be set up well to slot in the different abilities as you go through, and the upgrade paths seem to make it so that combat matters, and you can really strategize how you're going to evolve your uh, your playstyle. So I'd take a look at them, uh, get some other ships or other uh, things, because the components seem to just be wood blocks. Maybe you might want to customize it for something a little closer to your own uh, tastes with uh, some minis from another game maybe. Uh, but otherwise it seems interesting. Maybe the ships from Exploration will uh, suit your fancy. I am uh, in agreement with most of the ship types in this game. Uh, it's very similar to the one we just looked at for Exodus uh, as far as the way the gameplay runs, but it's a little more realistic and that part I like. Most of the ships, they look like they could spin, which is what you would need to create this interpretal force that would emulate gravity. If you didn't have gravity, if you weren't uh, somehow attached to the ship, when it powers up or accelerates in any direction, you will smack into the wall and go splat, right? So uh, that's one of the things. The artwork is as close to what is realistic as possible. Um, it's not as fantasy driven as, uh, Exodus, that space fantasy look. It's more along lines of, uh, what would it be if you had a mining, uh, ship or something like that, that, uh, was in the nearest future. Uh, the ones that look like space Corvettes and, and other kinds of things like that. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's popular in a lot of different, uh, science fiction, space fantasy, um, worlds, but it's totally unrealistic, but the ones where they look like satellites, yeah, there's a reason they look like satellites, is because that's what we use. Um, yeah, the solar sails, different kind of weird things like that are all possible, and uh, the one that says shield, like that's the one that most looks to me like it could, if you just flip it around and make it into solar sail. Um, so yeah, exploration, exodus, those are two good uh, space fan uh, options, if you had to pick one over the other, I might say uh, you're going to do it based on uh, how much you like exploring strange worlds and laying down the tiles. That might be the uh, the tiebreaker. But why not look at both? And finally, we're going to end with Wicked Ones. This is a tabletop RPG that they describe as Dungeon Keeper meets Blades in the Dark. I don't care about anything else because I stopped listening after they said they were including Dungeon Keeper, which is the greatest game of all time. I don't care what you're looking at. I would only say it's the greatest of all time that I never worked on because Planescape Torment was a thing I worked on the white box versions of uh, for when Windows XP originally came out. I did a bunch of testing for that so that they could sell it as part of a white box um, you know, uh, pack. All of the uh, Infinity Engine games I had to work on. So, barring ones I didn't work on, 
Dungeon Keeper, Dungeon Keeper 2 are the best games of all time for a PC. And I don't even know why you would need to make anything else other than more expansions for them. You build up a dungeon and then the heroes come out and attack it. That's what happens in Wicked Ones. They give you this toolkit with a bunch of different cards, a bunch of different types of uh, characters you can be. You can be the bad guy, right? If you've uh, never had a run at uh, an evil campaign, you don't really know how to pull it off. You think you're going to be too evil because uh, you don't want to. You're you're suspicious that you're just going to have to be Jeffrey Dahmer. No, that's not the case. You don't have to always be that way. Why not run a little bit on the dark side? Have a blast. It is a game of imagination expanded to its fullest, and uh, I really want to try this out. Unfortunately, it's going to be one of those things where I need other people to come in and play. So uh, if I could find another Dungeon Keeper fan, I'm sure the second they hear the mention of, the, of that game, they'll be jumping on it all over. If you want a good game that you can play for a couple of bucks, go get Dungeon Keeper and Dungeon Keeper 2 and... Uh, you know, especially play late into the night when it tells you the witching hour and all the other cool stuff and tells you, shouldn't you be in bed by now? And all the other fun things that they threw in. Oh, Bullfrog Games. They were a great studio. Absolutely amazing. Then speaking of nostalgia, I went down to Lions Drag Strip Museum for their opening today. My grandfather and my dad, they used to uh, hang out down there and race uh, top fuel dragsters, uh, lots of other different types of cars because uh, my grandfather had a wrecking yard and they would, uh, you know, make toys out of them and then run down and play with everybody else. Um, grandfather actually won one of the championships uh, in this category at least one time. Uh, the trophies and stuff are around the house somewhere. Um, but uh, the guy who uh, put it together at the Price Automobilia Group, Rick Lauren Rent. I can't pronounce his name. Rick Lorenzen. Uh, he put together a museum unlike anything you've probably seen outside of Vegas. Um, it, there's a, a really amazing uh, bunch of cars in there. Batmobiles and um, DeLoreans and stuff. The Thelma and Louise car, the bullet car, all that kind of stuff from movies. As well as original stands from Lions Drag Strip. Um, there's just so much preservation, things that were going on, pinball machines and model kits and everything else. It is an amazing toy box that you just have to witness to believe that uh, somebody had that much love to put into it. Um, so I'm going to let you know, if you're going to be in the Los Angeles area, you want to come around, you know, my neck of the woods and uh, see something, take your dad, your grandpa, wheel them around. It is wheelchair accessible um, everywhere. And because uh, they know a lot of these guys, I mean, this was the 60s, so 60 years ago, uh, these folks are not uh, young and uh, it might bring them some joy and, and everything. They really, really did an amazing job of uh, making the museum happen. And with that, that's it for me. If you have any comments, questions or concerns, games you want to see, uh, again, I tell you all, all the time that the only way to get on the channel is either I stumble across your uh, campaign or somebody else suggests you, which is what happened on a bunch of these campaigns. Uh, you can put suggestions in the comments, contact me any other way you want. Uh, if you have anything that you do want to put up, uh, keep in mind you can't put your suggest your own campaigns. You have to get somebody else to suggest it for you. Why? Because if you can't get at least one other person to believe in you, your game's not ready yet. That's just how it works. Um, if you have anything else that you want me to be aware of or you want other people to be aware of, just be nice in the comments. And uh, if I got anything wrong, you can throw corrections and stuff in there too. I'll leave them up there. Have a good one.